they have Larry Haskell speaking on Friday, and that should be March 17th, sorry about that, is Sulani Madsen, who writes for the Spokesman Review. Uh, and then the Spokane County GOP is having their Lincoln Day on June 3rd. So I know a lot of you in uh, surrounding counties and states, high Idaho, uh, have already had your Lincoln Day. Uh, Spokane GOP is doing theirs a little bit later, and they're having Tommy Lamb. Uh, other than that, next movie night, and I think this is going to be very interesting considering the uh, replace and repeal and all the kind of stuff going on with Obama, it, we are going to have Dr. Roger Stark speak to us. Uh, he's with the Washington Policy Center, uh, and he is their health care policy analyst. And I've used him a lot in the past when I've needed to have data and things that way about health care in Washington. Like, for example, and could you ask him to turn the cooler on because it's getting very warm in here, I think. Uh, and anyway, yes. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I wanted to know really what's going to happen to Washington State when the federal government no longer subsidizes the Medicaid and things that way. And he, he was very, very beneficial at providing information. So I think he's going to be interesting and will, you know, really analyze what's going on with the replace and repeal, come with questions. I think it'll be a very, very informative evening. So then we go to our open mic time. And I always like it when people let me know ahead of time that they are, you know, are going to be here and uh, want to speak about things because then that way I can sort of schedule them in and if they have any presentation materials and things that way we can provide. And I'm waiting for John to get back to his chair because he needs to be doing something here. Well, pay attention. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, we do have a guest speaker. Uh, Pastor Ian Ro Robertson. Uh, he is retired. He spent 50 years of his life in the ministry. He was the 2007 Spokane Valley Citizen of the Year. He has a new project, the Inland Northwest Fuller Center Project. Um, there are things in this project that you'll probably agree with, and there are things that you won't agree with, but that's why we're here. We have open mic, and you're sure welcome to ask him questions at the end of this. And he does have a presentation. That's why I was getting John going here. So come on up here, Pastor Robertson. Yeah. So what we do is we stay inside these lines, okay. and you probably know more about mics than I do, but you hold it close, and that way everybody can hear you. And this is your clicker, okay. and Thank it goes you. that way, and when John gets you going there, you'll be in good shape. Thank you. Did any of you attend that great rally last Saturday night? Uh, here, there. I was talking to Larry Haskell today. He said that these two were the ones that put that whole thing together. Wasn't that tremendous? I was so inspired uh, by that. And I tell you, the report in the Spokesman Review following the day, wow, this is our day. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all that uh, you are doing there. Okay, you remember Hagar the Horrible. We insist you spend our tax money on the poor, says uh, Lucky Eddie. I am, says the king. I'm sinking a fortune into dungeon construction. And we have sunk a fortune into the poor and got nowhere over the last 50 years. In fact, we have spent $22 trillion on a war of poverty. And poverty rates were actually going down until we started the war on poverty. And it's got, it hasn't got any better with all that money there. And uh, there is a better way, a better way to break the cycle of poverty. Only for-profit businesses create wealth. Government, non-profits, churches, all they can do is transfer wealth from one person's pocket to another person's pocket. And we need to have a business approach. And I tell you, we as Republicans, with what's happening on the national scene, is our, is our wonderful opportunity uh, to make a difference in the lives of people all around us there. You remember, we'll look back at the success of the 50-year war on poverty in improving the lives of millions of government employees waging the 50-year war on poverty. That's the situation today. And I say now is the time to make America great 
for working families as well as for other people. And we have a wonderful opportunity as we're talking about working families. Here's a family I'm working with, Sam and Samantha. They're renting a three-bedroom home, $1,000 a month, a little below the uh, average here. In 15 years, they will spend $180,000 in rent. They can purchase an affordable home from us for $35,000, saving $145,000. That's the situation. We are keeping people in servitude, in poverty, the way we are treating them. Uh, that blue line is actually the rent going up there, 15 years, $180,000, that's supposed to be there, or $35,000 for a home. The difference there, $145,000. This is the situation. And when Trump is telling us maybe that it was the working people that helped us win the elections, this, here is something that we can provide Away the American dream for people that have not experienced it. And I say if one struggling family can save $145,000 over a 15-year period, think what would happen when a thousand families or a million families, we're talking about $145 billion that could be saved. Money that will go not into some uh, uh, rich person's pocket as much as it will be recirculating into the, in the community. It will mean jobs. It will mean business. It'll be opportunities for all of us there. Struggling families. United Way, as, uh, in Spokane County, we have 68,000 families struggling. State of Washington, 847. Across the border there in Idaho, 18,000. Statistically, it's about a third of the population struggling. And these are the ones, when they see what we are doing, the opportunity, people who want. Now, there's people on the streets, you know, uh, uh, we can't do much about them. They, some people, some people, you know, I worked at the, uh, the, the um, um, uh, f food bank here. And we say it's an emergency food bank. But we're dealing with people that have been on a 14-year emergency. You know, it's the same people over and over again. We can't do much for those. But for those who want to aspire after owning something, we can do something to help them. There's over a million in our two states hurting that we can make a difference. And so one of the solutions is giving them an opportunity. This is like Lincoln's um, <clears throat> Homestead Act. You know, move out west. Plant, a, uh, take a, some property there, build a house, build a barn, and in five years, it's going to be yours. And we're saying homeowners do a much better job of looking after these things. And so that's my top six reasons. <laughs> Simple, built for fun, avoids insane debt. Wow. And you know, with people, with the volunteers, the organization that I'm part of, $350 a month. They can actually own their own home. And this is coming down the pike, and I just appreciate it because I believe that as I've got the support of, you know, Kathy Momotis Rogers and, and uh, all the Republicans uh, that in, the, in the valley there, the support of that, this is an opportunity that we can make the li a difference in the lives of other people. Alice, that is United Way's uh, statistics that I'm basing all this on. Asset limited, income constrained, employed. They can't afford the five basic necessities of life. Housing, child care, food, transportation, and health care. And struggling families, we can bring them into our way of conservative thinking there. That's the, the village, the first one that we will be putting in actually in Spokane Valley here. A number of uh, people without going into any more details, but uh, thank you for that. Together, we want to make... America great again and include these working families there. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You guys are doing a fantastic job. God bless you. Oh, you stay there. You have questions. oh. questions. You have to speak up. I'm half deaf. Okay. Uh, but if you... Any questions? Okay, here, you're doing the mic. You're doing the mic. Hello, hello, hello. Is this working? Okay. They have microphones. Okay, good. Okay, I may be wrong. But... Just got to put it up to your mouth. I tried to. I tried to. Um, 
on the uh, thing that you showed up there, that would, to, to me that would be considered as a mini house. Are they what? A mini, mini house. house. Yeah, they're actually co decided as cottages. Right. No okay, wheels in the city of Spokane Valley. Yes. Okay. Well, then there's no wheels on it, or, or, or is it is is same thing as a trailer, right? It's not a trailer. It's a it's a house. Okay, but it's, it's a, on it's on a frame and it, and it gets there on wheels, but they take the wheels off. No, we actually build them on skids. We okay. built some on wheels, but uh, I tell you, if people are going to live in it permanently, it's got to be treated as a house, and they'll pay taxes on the house like the rest of us do. Right, because it's got yeah. a footing foundation under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't get me too technical. <laughs> no problem. I was just wondering. I'm a, I'm a general contractor, and that's why I was wondering. Oh, yes. Okay. No, we've got a company. I'm looking at the same thing in a different direction up in around Cleelum area. Great. Good. Okay. I, I have a question with, while you're running the mic over here. John Christina has. Oh, Christina's over there. Nope. My uh, quick question for you. It's Lee. Sorry. Ian. Ian. Yeah, so my quick question. So I, uh, I didn't. Yeah, I'm an immigrant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, good deal. I kind of feel like I am too. I came from L.A. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I got to look at these because they were, you know, you, you sent them over to Sussex. So I was looking, and, and and you know, likewise, I was a builder for 25 years. I look at these, and and what I'm noticing in your, uh, in, in this presentation is. And I don't want to say it's misleading. I just want to say that you don't have any of the costs in there besides the house. You got to have the land. You got to have the hookups. You got to have the utilities. There's a lot of things that go with this. That is correct. And, and, and it looks to me like, from if I can bounce back on your little map here real quick, this this looks like so you'd have some kind of a, a homeowners association or something. There's got to be dues in here to maintain the laundry room and the other things that have to be here to fulfill those needs number one we've got churches that are donating the land the first church here has got a 99 year lease at a dollar a year oh good people that want to do that I've had over 300 acres made available for this kind of stuff we have more generous people in Spokane than about any other place I know and people that say we need to be making this available community land trust is another key word where the value of the land will you know remain constant and they will actually own just the property thank you great okay. question great. yeah yeah just a quick question what is the uh, average square footage of these uh, cottages oh gosh now he asked me these technical <laughs> questions um, at 384 uh, square foot at 32 foot by 12 is the the footprint there second floor it can be half a uh, half of that would add about half of that again there so between 500 600 the largest one with actually four bedrooms one two three no five bedrooms and two baths 778 square feet uh, it's amazing what can be packed in a small you know in good creative right we've had 14 architects volunteer their services all members of AIA doing the design work for us Again, did I say we have generous people around here? We do. We do. Yeah, and I assume that uh, these are prefabricated housing? Yes, we've got a company that's actually building them, and hopefully we may need more companies to be building them, hiring some of the people that uh, need work. Yes, right here in this area. Excellent. Thank Built you. Built in America. <laughs> yeah. Question up there. Here, I'll get it. I saw a hand. <laughs> right up to you, Okay, mouth. I have a question. Since Trump is thinking and con seriously considering doing bridges, roads, and dams, since we need that infrastructure, would you be also in the future looking at putting wheels on this so if people have jobs that they have to move, that we, they can no, move these trailers? Never mind. Yes, yeah, they can, they can be put on wheels, uh, definitely, yes. But have you considered the cost of doing this, or would that be their concern to work on? Yeah, trailer costs is about $8,500 more, so right now, it's, it, uh, yeah, it can be considered. Uh, we just, this is the way we're starting just now, yeah. Anyone else? 
Okay, one, one more. One over here. Yeah, he's had his hand up. <coughs> I just had to buy a new tank of oil, so I've got to ask, are these things heavily insulated? This is a part of the country where it stays kind of cold this time of year. Uh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> they have to bring the same requirements as for the houses, for snow loads and insulation and all that kind of stuff. So go through the same city codes, international codes. Yes. That was my question, except the R factor. But also, with this center that you have there, is all the hookups in, or is that? It, 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 it has to have Can you sewer bring some extra chairs? Oh, right, yes. Just it just has to be connected down. with a sewer, electricity, and water. We don't hook up gas, actually. That gets a little more complicated so for these those. These centers where you have the land and that, it's already got the roads and the divided up and... It will be, and each one, the first one actually we're talking about, is, or we're planning on, is right on Broadway, a church just uh, east of Walmart. Is it natural gas or, or what type no of... No gas. We're not putting gas in. Electric? Yeah, all electric. And it's green and uh, aquaponic farming and other stuff that goes along with it. Yes? Do these families have to uh, qualify? You better believe it. Yes. No drugs, no alcohol. And they do sign a, sign a covenant to, to make sure that it's kept up as homeowners would. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeff, would you mind? There's some chairs in the hallway there. Maybe we can put them back in that corner so everybody can sit down. That would be great. Okay, so this is open mic time. Does anybody else have something to say? We have a gentleman in the back and a lady in the front. Great. Up here, you gotta stay in the lines. Hold the microphone close to your mouth. Can you make it through? <laughs> yeah, that's trick. Great. Hello, my name is Scott Ellsworth. I just wanted to come introduce myself to all of uh, you. More? Does that work better? That's better. Everybody can hear me now? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to come introduce myself. My name is Scott Ellsworth. I'm actually running for state representative for District 7. In the back. Um, so I just announced my candidacy last week. So you probably have never heard of me because I've actually never really been too involved with politics. Um, at least not on this level. So I just wanted to come out meet you fine people and I've gone to the rally last week that was an awesome rally I've never been to a rally um, inadvertently I have been to a protest that I ran away from because I never want to be involved with one of those and that was in downtown Seattle but uh, I just want to give you guys a real quick bio of who I am and what I'm about uh, I was born and raised in Elk Washington uh, I attended school at Riverside High School from kindergarten all the way up to my senior year uh, my kids currently go to that same school. Um, I have one uh, stepson who is going to the University, excuse me, the Art Institute of Seattle, um, studying to be a chef. Uh, my daughter is a senior in high school, and I have a son who's in also in eighth grade. So uh, my dad was a teacher at that same school for 30 years. So it is a little true and dear to my heart about what goes on at that school, not only because I'm an alumni there and my kids go there, but I know a lot of the teachers there personally. So that's one of my platforms that of me running on is education and how our money is spent. Um, I actually had a conversation with John about some of the wages that are made currently by some of our superintendents there, and that was one of our problems we had not recently up at Riverside. You might have seen me on TV. I was voicing my opinion pretty loudly at one of the school board meetings. So. Um, I am a former law enforcement officer. I was a deputy sheriff down in Whitman County for 10 years. Um, I also worked for some of the small towns down there for Palouse Police Department and Uniontown Police Department. If you blink, you probably would have missed Uniontown, but if you have ever been down to Clarkston, you drive right through it. Um, if you were doing 35, I probably stopped you. So, um, Gotta make some money somehow. Yeah, it wasn't a money maker. <laughs> I wasn't a big ticket writer. Um, but my profession's actually an auto diesel mechanics. I currently work for Spokane Transit. Um, as a diesel mechanic there and a servicer. So the nice pretty buses you see driving along, I've driven every single one of them repeatedly and probably fixed them. So um, 
other than that, you know, I look forward to meeting you guys. I could stand up here all day and tell you everything I'm for or against, but I can't. <laughs> so if you'd like to uh, come talk to me anytime tonight, that'd be great. Um, I got some cards out here for you while I'm waiting for my official cards. Um, but I can get you some information. I'd be glad to talk to you about anything under the sun. So I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. So yeah, we had some changes in the 7th District with Brian Dansel moving on to the administration and Shelley Short moving up to the Senate and her legislative aide taking over her position. So we're going to be seeing some changes and I really appreciate you coming tonight and introducing yourself. I don't need that mic. I believe you are next. And I am so glad this lady brought the information with her because I had it all printed out to talk about and then I left it at home. So this is perfect and I want you all to do it. Good evening, deplorables. My name is Rosie. Um, I was talking to Cicely today and I brought up something and she says, oh, I forgot about that. So I said, okay, I'll write it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. gotta okay. hold it up Let me start and stay over. in the lines. Oh, sorry. And just go on to what you're going to do. Don't, okay. No starting over. Uh, no starting over. Okay. So um, Cicely and I were speaking about something, and she did not. Can you hear me? No. Oh. Just tell them what we want them to do. Okay. On March 15th, you. Sh is too loud? No. Sharpen your wits and send your sincerest wishes and support our president one postcard or a dozen and take a picture of yourself doing this and send it to President Donald J. Trump, the White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20500. We will bury the post office with complete support of who we are, honored that he was willing to take on this job and that we will stand with him. So if you want that address, I can leave this paper here and you can, hmm? That address is everywhere. Oh, yeah. okay. So um, I just want to say something. I used to be a Democrat and, and believe it or not, people always used to say GOP, GOP. I'm like, what the freak is GOP? Does anybody know what GOP is? Grand old party. Grand old party. So I was Googling it. And there's a little history with the elephant and the donkey. Does everybody know about that too? <laughs> well, I believe one of the, I think it was Jefferson, one of his employees called him a jackass. And he took that to be the donkey and then he used it for his campaigns. And then the president, uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant was running and he thought he was gonna run three times so that's where the elephant came in. And I was reading about it. I was like, if I'm going to be a Dem uh, Republican now, I got to know what I'm into. Because, yeah, I've, my whole life I've been a Democrat, and Democra democracy is not the same. Um, so no. anyway, I'm learning. So, But if we can do this by March 15th, we all flood the post office with our postcards to showing support. That's what this whole thing I'm talking about is sending cards to the president and showing him support. I mean, we could do rallies and all that, but this is another way. Absolutely. All right. I think it's a great idea. All right. I thought so too. So anyway, thank you. I didn't think of it, but yeah. Thanks, right. Rosie. Thank Thanks very much. And while Rosie's here, and why don't we just ask all our veterans to stand up and all the people that serve in the military and let's say thank you. This. I mean, this is cool. And then you have something to say. Oh. Right up by your mouth. I know. This is just cool. My name is Harvey Dunham, and I was reading a book the other day called Professional Politicians by William McCraw. And it's about the people who founded the state of Texas. And uh, a little history on each of the people that you might recognize, like Lubbock or Houston, etc. And I'd like to just read this to you. It's not very long, but you've probably heard that history repeats itself. And listen to this. 
When laws are passed, they should be enforced, for they are but commands of the people to their officers. People who would encourage and not condemn the crime of official delinquency have but to wait to glean oppression's harvest. A government that permits a law to be disobeyed commits itself to a precedent that in time will be pleaded in justification of anarchy. Texas wants capital, but craves not a dollar that would defy her laws in one instance and invoke them in another. She welcomes immigrants, but condemns or on condition that they obey her laws. Thus did Attorney General James Stephen Hogg in beginning his canvass for the Democratic nomination for governor in 1890 reaffirm the political creed to which he had steadfastly held through his long and stormy years of public service. That was in 1890 <laughs> when President George W. Bush ignores and refuses to enforce immigration laws for eight years, followed by another president who refuses to enforce immigration laws and the drug laws for eight years. According to this, it may lead to anarchy. Something to think about. Absolutely. Anyone else? I got one more. I'll always take the opportunity to speak for a second or two. I'm Tony Keepy. I am a candidate for Spokane City Council District 2. Woo! That's the South Hill. I need your help. I need your support. But I tell you, if you like road diets, the city spending $65,000 for one mile of bike lane, if you love potholes and you like snow berms in your street, I am not your candidate because that's not what I'm going to support. You might have read this week the in the Spokesman Day. Review, uh, they're, we'll with the roll diet on Monroe, they're, taking it, they're going to stripe it, spend a half a million dollars, take five lanes down to three lanes just so we can see how this works. I can tell you right now, it won't work. We're going to kill businesses. This is bad for the neighborhood, it's bad for businesses, and our city council does not need to be involved with this. Last year, they passed an ordinance where businesses, 10 or more employees, you have to offer over 40 hours of sick leave during the year, and if you don't use it, you lose it. So what's going to happen in December? You're going to be taking that sick time. So keep me in mind, I have envelopes here, Tony Keepy, City Council. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Tony. And guys, to me, this is the most important thing we have to do is change the Spokane City Council makeup. It's crazy. And if we don't, they're going to creep over here to the valley. <laughs> when I heard her talking about the postcard, it brought to mind, I work at web.com. Uh, we create websites for small businesses. And about three years ago, um, oh, my name's Karen Osborne. About three years ago, I was creating a website for an immigration attorney in Maryland. And he told me that the Obama administration was the mob in suits. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else for open mic? Super. Well, that was fun. Thank you all for participating. That's great. So we go into national issues, and there is so much to talk about. I'm just not really sure where to start. Uh, this is day 48 of the presidency. Uh, there's still two cabinet positions to fill. Uh, Department of Agriculture and Labor, but there's 1,212 positions that require state confirmation and uh, Senate confirmation, excuse me. So if you're interested, if you have a talent that you really feel that this administration can use, uh, if you go to greatagain.gov, you will find an area there where you can apply online and goodness knows you may end up working in the administration. <laughs> so it, it is, it's a crazy, crazy time. So there have been 28 executive actions, a lot on law and order and security, 
Uh, regulations, I love the idea of rolling back these darn regulations and making them simpler and a little easier to live with. Uh, infrastructure, stuff on hiring, you know, the hiring freeze I think is great. Abortion, TPP, of course, he just said we aren't participating. Education, so he has been busy. Now, was that yesterday or today he came out with the, or the, the House came out with the repeal and replace? And there's a lot of disgruntled talk about it, um, but it does end the mandates. It ends federal funding for Planned Parenthood. Woo! It repeals many of the taxes. Uh, if you have a, um, a health savings account, your uh, over-the-counter medications qualify as an expense. And rather than a 10% floor on medical expense deductions, it's gone back down to the 7.5 that it was before Obamacare. So those are some good things. They have left some of the stuff in. Children are still, they call them children. Now, if you guys are 24, 25 years old, do you want to be called a child? I don't think so. But, oh, but anyway, they can stay on their parents' health insurance until age 26. Uh, Pre-existing conditions are, are to be covered by the insurance companies. Uh, health insurance benefits that are provided to you by your employer will still be reported on your W-2. And there's no tort reform and there's no insurance availability across state lines. So that's something that people really got a little upset about. So we want to talk about it because what we need to understand is the process of getting legislation through the House and the Senate. Now we all know in the House that it just takes a, a simple majority to get things through. But in the Senate, how many of you think that it takes 60 votes to pass a law? It takes 60 votes to allow a bill to come to the floor of the Senate. So if they don't want a bill to come to the floor and you don't have 60 votes, that bill is never going to see the light of day. How many Republicans have we got in the Senate? 52. Are you going to find eight more Democrats to join with those Republicans to hear a repeal uh, vote on, medic on, on Obamacare. I'll be with you in a minute. So the deal is, is they have to be about as smart as Pelosi and Reid were when they passed Obamacare with not one Republican vote. They recognized that the highest level to get over was the Senate. And you don't think of it as being a 60% majority. What you want to think of it is, is being a 41% minority can hold up legislation. That's what makes us a republic. That is a good thing. It means that the minority has a voice. Otherwise, would just be, you know, mob rule. So the Senate is extremely important, and it's extremely important that we keep that 60, 60 vote uh, guideline that we have. So people, when they say, well, they want the Republicans to go nuclear and, you know, forget the 60 vote thing and everything, what you're really doing is totally dismantling what our founders wanted the Senate to be. They want it to be a voice for the minority. So we really don't want that to happen. But the Democrats back in 2009 recognized that to get Obamacare passed, they were going to have to do some pretty crazy things. So the first thing that Reed, they, they recognized they wanted it passed in the Senate first. So they took a firefighter's uh, uh, retirement bill, mopped it up a little bit, but it was still called this firefighter's uh, retirement whatever, whatever bill, uh, to get it onto the floor of the Senate. Well, who is going to vote against having the firefighters have retirement? They aren't. So they got the bill on the floor, and within the bill, there was a lot of the structure of Obamacare. So that's what they passed. 
Well, then you know that it has to go to the house, and the house needs to sort of reconcile it and come back with something. But they also recognized that if the House changed the Senate bill at all, then it would go back to the Senate and they would get into the reconciliation process. So Nancy Pelosi convinced every Democrat to vote for the Senate bill exactly the way it was presented. And they did. So that is how they got Obamacare in. I think it was at 1.38 in the morning after sequestering the Senate for two weeks. So that's, you know, how we ended up with Obamacare. And then they went to work on changing it and giving uh, Sebelius, the uh, health head, uh, just tons of powers to make the regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've ended up with Obamacare. So we technically need to be thinking about that because the Senate can reconcile things and they can work on bills as long as they don't impact our budget negatively over a 10-year period, that kind of thing. But to just go into the Senate and say we're going to repeal Obamacare, are they going to get the votes? Absolutely not. There are not eight Democrats that are going to defect. So that's not an option. So we, we have an option of doing absolutely nothing, which we're not doing now because that's been put out there, and allow Obamacare to collapse because it is not economically sustainable and it would collapse over time. But a lot of people would be hurt by that. It's not a good way to go. The repeal and replace, if you use a three-phase approach to that, could work. And this is where we really need to start trusting our administration. And this is being sort of worked together with Tom Price, Paul Ryan, and Donald Trump. So pass reconciliation legislation targeting the financial mechanisms. So you've seen a lot of that there with, with eliminating the mandates and stuff like that. Then HHS gets to rewrite the rules. That doesn't have to be approved by the Senate or the House. Tom Price gets to start rewriting the rules. And then the third phase of this, after this sort of gets all washed out, is then you start working with new laws that, propose, that will be proposed by a full Congress to really adjust Obamacare and add to it and get those laws debate, debated and passed. But if you just say that we're going to repeal it, you're not going to get it through. Um, if you start just passing bills to repeal, you're just going to watch them pile up. And that's exactly the same thing that happened. The House has passed, what, 14 repeal bills? Because they knew they would, I mean, they just kept passing them, and they knew Harry Reid would get them, and they'd never go anywhere. But they're going back to their constituents and saying, we did this. So, and they knew it was going to do any good. So there's no point of us continuing that. So it's really what we've got to do, and I don't want to sound like Peggy, is we really need to trust the process because their hands are pretty well tied. And if they, you know, a lot of the things that they're proposing, if it uh, is impacting budgets, the re you know, the, those things will only stay in place for 10 years. So it's, uh, it's a tricky path they're walking. And so would I like to see insurance across state lines? Absolutely. Do I want to see tort reform? You're darn right. Do I want to see some other things? Yes, but we can't get it all at once just because of the way that, you know, we've structured this and it is a good way. We may not like it right now, but it is the way that our government works and operates and we need to honor that way of doing it. So that's what I know about help care and repeal and replace. <clears throat> so nothing much more there. Uh, the replacement would be temporary and only last 10 years. And that again goes back to the budget things. I'm going to get a drink of, it's not water, but I'll drink it. Yay. Safer. Uh, so it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't think I'd like to work under all those rules and regulations myself. Okay, so now we have heard the news media go on for how long now? That the Russians, 
the Russians are absolutely got this country in the palm of their hands. They've influenced the election and any other thing that the left doesn't like. I mean, the Russians are just all over the place. And it's getting pretty old. I think most people are starting to roll their eyes when they hear about the Russians anymore. Uh, and it's just the media continually trying to rev up the story. And it just doesn't, to my way of looking at it, have many legs. But it is true that Donald Trump did use Russian dressing during the campaign. That is absolutely true. And I like this cartoon. After a thorough investigation, the highest elected official we could find that has not met with the Russian ambassador is the DC dog catcher. <laughs> but, you know, I want you to wait a minute because we just found evidence that President Trump did meet with the Russian submarine captain. <laughs> so there may be something more to this than we all think. Now, the other thing is, is that we know I mean, we absolutely know that Trump Tower wasn't tapped because Clapper and Comey say it wasn't. So what do you think? You know, it's really funny. Trump cannot reveal one thing that he's learned in security briefings. If he does, that is just a, I mean, that, that, that's a no-no, that's off with your head kind of thing. But he sure can start an investigation, and I just love the tweets. I think they're, they're, they're just a kick in the butt because they really get everybody just talking about this and talking and looking a little more. And then you find out, yeah, they did, they did uh, want an investigation in June and it was denied, you know, a wiretap in June, it was denied. And then they got one approved in October and then this happened and then that happened. Then you're going, what more has happened? So that tweeting is really sort of fun. You've got to remember, and I don't care what they tell you, I don't think they changed much that NSA gathers every keystroke, every call, every piece of data that they can is gathered. And uh, it, it's out there and it can be recovered. And the NSA is a department of the Department of Defense. And Donald Trump technically can demand, he can ask, he can demand that they provide investigation information because the NSA is under him uh, as part of the military. So this, this could get interesting. Uh, but anyway, it's just a lot of news media to keep us entertained. I think possibly we should be a little bit more concerned about North Korea and Iran. That's my opinion. But, uh, you know, you got to listen to these guys. Never happened. Now, a lot happened in a short period of time between our last meeting and tonight. Uh, the Main Street Patriots uh, started an idea of Spirit of America rallies, and a group of us uh, just got together and said, let's get it done. And it resulted in a great rally at Center Place, uh, well attended. Uh, the guest speakers were, were great. Uh, the Spokesman Review even published a pretty positive story about it. I was amazed. And uh, we had a lot of fun. See, see, see Scott, there you are. <laughs> that, that was great. And uh, then we had uh, pro-Trump rallies actually all across the country. The one in Olympia, we determined we didn't want to do ours outside. Mostly because we didn't know what the weather was going to do and it's cold. And secondly, it's a lot harder to secure something in a public park than it is in an enclosed uh, private setting. So we had absolutely no demonstrators, no problems, anything that way. But in Olympia, they did end up with a little bit of a problem. They had four people arrested. There was a Washington State trooper that uh, had to go to the hospital because an unknown substance uh, was thrown at him. And as we know, the uh, in, in indivisible group uh, teaches their people to throw blood and urine and things that way. So, of course, the guy didn't know what he was hit with, so he had to go to the, the hospital to have that checked out. Uh, but what was really cool is we arrested people in Olympia, Washington. I mean, way better than Berkeley, California. Uh, the suspects were booked into the uh, Thurston County Jail on suspicion of assaulting a police officer, and uh, hopefully they... Uh, won't do that again. So uh, we are hoping to have more rallies and show more support. 
but I really think the next thing that you should do is look up the postcard deal, send a postcard into the White House, you can find the address on the internet, and uh, just let the Trump administration know that you support them. Uh, we, we need to do that because there's everything in the world against this administration. You don't, just don't have the Democrats and the media and the celebrities and things. You've got some Republicans. You've got, you got some problems uh, with people just not wanting anything to change in Washington, D.C., and they're going to do everything they can do to keep it from happening. So send in those postcards. So in statewide issues, I didn't bring a whole lot of stuff, um, but I thought this was pretty cool, uh, even though it failed. But our uh, Spokane area senators uh, voted uh, for this, and what it was was a constitutional amendment to prohibit a state income tax. And wouldn't that be great? Because we know that the... Dems on the west side are doing everything they can do, well, the Dems on the east side too, to figure out how to get a state income tax just a foot in the door. You know, let's just, let's just talk tax people that make a lot of money. Let's do this. Let, but it's, it's a way of getting their foot in the door. And I thought this was a great idea, a great amendment. Didn't pass, but, uh, you know, we didn't need uh, just six more votes. Would have done it. So... Uh, say thank you to your local representatives and let's keep on trying. We had a win here by Senator Padden. This was a bill that he sponsored and it, it passed 49 to nothing. And I think you probably all remember when the uh, Department of Corrections in Washington started releasing early release people that shouldn't have been early released and that kind of thing. So this all came about from the investigation of what Department of Corrections needed to do to get uh, that situation cleaned up and uh, the, the bill passed. So I'm sure Senator Patton's happy. Now, Initiative 1552, we just want privacy.org. Do we have initiatives here? Rob disappeared? Rob's gone. No, okay, the initiatives were forgotten. But you can go on the internet, you can print them, but you need, really need to send them to a print place because they need to be printed on the big paper, things that way. But I really encourage all of you to go and, and have a couple of, there's 20 signatures per initiative. Get some printed up and get those signatures gathered. We need 330,000 of them. Let's get the signatures. Kelly, did you have something to say? You have a lot of them? There's a small stack there. Small stack, okay. That's 1011 E second. Okay, so sorry we don't have them here. They were supposed to be. There are three sites gathering petitions to recall Jay Inslee. But be careful. One of the sites have your petition going to Bob Ferguson. What do you think Bob Ferguson is going to do with that petition? Right. One goes to the state House of Representatives. What do you think will happen to that one? Circular file. And the third one goes to the U.S. Congress. So make sure when you're filling out one of these, it says target. Make sure it says U.S. Congress. That's the one that you're going to, going to, uh, going to sign. Do recognize that Jay Inslee basically swore that oath that he'd support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Washington. And he has violated that oath and he needs to be recalled. And you all need to look up that petition. You need to do what you can to get him recalled. Clint Didier has them right. I have them up on mine. I think we've put them up on other things. So, but just be careful where it says target, make sure that it says U.S. Congress. Hmm? We need to recall Inslee as the governor of the state of Washington. Okay. We, mm -hmm. Can I email it out? People really get angry at us for too many emails. 
So you've got to Facebook and do those kinds of things. I mean, we, we had a gentleman unsubscribe today, good friend. He says, there's just too many emails. So, you know, try and get your information through social media and things that way because uh, we, we irritate people if we send out too many emails, let me tell you. Uh, anybody, I know Josh Kearns promised that he will be here next month and give us a county update. Anybody want to give us anything about the county tonight? I know they passed another emergency ordinance on the Hearst decision so that most people can get building permits for a little bit more. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure what's going on in Spokane County. So, yes? Uh, I don't know exactly where it is, but Andy Billick is having a town hall meeting on Saturday. Correct. All of them are. It's a group town hall. Uh, you can go to his page. It's there. Higher taxes. And honestly, guys, you should look up those things and attend them and ask some good questions. Be respectful, but start, you know, we need to do the same thing that our opponents do, and that is show up at the town hall meetings and ask questions that are a little bit hard for them to answer. So we'll go to Spokane City. We're going to get local, and we have Tim Ben here to fill us in on Spokane City and also let us know a little bit about what he's doing. Hey, Tim. Thank you, Cecily. Well, I am running for city council, so I'd love your support if you can help me in any way, shape, or form. If you're a business owner, uh, if you want to be a donor, you can put up a sign if you live in the district. Um, Got a lot of stuff going on, actually, personally, but we'll stick to City Council for right now. Um, coming up here next week, City Council will be voting to uh, give the first installment of $900,000, uh, I don't know if you saw it in the media, to the um, uh, Rid Path Hotel. Anyone know the story of the Rid Path? Uh, about a year or two ago, I think it was, a fellow went to jail because they were selling interest to the project to folks and uh, ran out for the money. So now the city's going to get involved with it. Uh, total, it'll be, let's see, uh, $1.75 million they're going to give to the construction project. So you can come Monday and talk about that. Um, the other thing going on is the city council is thinking about doing another charter change. So when charter changes happen, it's basically the constitution of the city. So we went to a strong mayor city in uh, 1999. Well, that separated the council and the mayor with the legal department. The city council hired their own legal uh, staff, an attorney, uh, just recently. And so what they're trying to do with this charter change is create their own legal entity. So that'll be coming up in the next few weeks too. So pay attention to city council. Um, got some so activists on there and they're looking to stop the trains. So we could be in a situation where the taxpayers will be paying for the mayor's office to protect itself from the city council and instead of having a political debate, we'll have litigation. So, is there any questions about Spokane City? Any, uh, any other happenings? Uh, did I understand on the uh, attorney situation that the change in constitution is that the, he will be appointed by the council for a seven year term? Yes. And does that mean the, the mayor no longer has a, no longer gets a city attorney? No, what that means is so that they already have a, a city staff uh, for the attorneys um, for city uh, business, all city business, whether it's initiatives, uh, housing, whatever it is. So it's that's, underneath. that attorney represents the council and the mayor? Right. The, the attorney staff, Piccolo and, and even Brian McClatchy. Currently, if you watch a city council meeting, there's an attorney that is the council's representative. It used to be Piccolo that sat there. Now it's Brian McClatchy. Uh, but technically, when... Well, city council's done a lot of things. They wanted their own attorney, their own finance guy, their own budget guy. Um, so they've increased their own budget by over 40% just in the last five years. And that's not including the 44% pay increase they wound up with. So, yeah, they went from 35,000 a year to, to, I think, just a little over 45,000. Um, so what this does is this separates, because McClatchy currently works under the legal staff in the mayor's office. This charter change will create a completely separate legal staff and entity under the city council. So if the city council of Ben Stuckard or Brianne Beggs 
gets a couple more votes on the council, which of course they have a super majority right now uh, of progressive uh, activists on the council, they vote to sue the mayor's office for whatever reason, then the mayor will have to protect himself with his attorneys, which really all those attorneys work for us. So we could end up uh, over and over in litigation um, with activist groups like the activist groups that want to stop the trains. Um, there's another initiative that could be coming to the council soon. It's already been written. We're just waiting for the council to vote on it. If you heard a couple years ago, or actually last year, they, uh, they voted to send an initiative to the voters that would have fined the railroads for every car that had oil or coal in it. Well, they can't do that because it's a commodity. It's, you know, the federal transportation uh, agencies are the ones in charge of that. And actually the railroad, because they're an uh, interstate commerce infrastructure, they can't turn down loads of freight if it's a reasonable, reasonable request. So that thing got deemed, uh, you know, unlawful uh, by, the, uh, by, the, by the attorneys in the city's uh, departments. The attorneys told the city council it was illegal and they voted to send it to the voters anyway. Knowingly, that knowing it was, you know, so basically they violated their oath of office, they broke the law knowingly. Well then Burlington Northern sent some pretty scathing letters with a lot of past lawsuits that have happened stating that, you know, basically they were gonna sue the city of Spokane out of existence. So uh, they turned around the very next week and then pulled the initiative back. Well, now that there's a new initiative that's the same group, uh, Envision Spokane is, is behind, and that initiative, what it'll do is it will stop city employees and the city police from arresting people who stand on the railroad tracks. So, um, yeah, so what that does is then it tells our city that they can no longer enforce basically trespassing laws. So we'll see what the city council does on that. Yes. That was thought about in the writing of the initiative. I don't have all the verbiage in front of me. I don't have it memorized. But there was something in there that the police have to protect the protesters. So the police would then, underneath this illegal initiative, would have to arrest the Burlington Northern uh, staff. So what his question was is, Burlington Northern has their own policing agencies to protect their uh, their railroads from, you know, probably environmentalist activists that are pulling railroad spikes. Well, well so. Tim, I think it really means what does protect mean? And I would think that our police officers would make sure that the Burlington Northern law enforcement doesn't hurt those people, but will allow them to arrest, arrest them lawfully. It could be, but yes. nevertheless, it'd be, it probably would never be put into place. What it'll do is just cause lots of litigation. It'll cost the taxpayers a lot of money and we'll, still, money. Have, and we'll still have potholes and we'll still have you know, rotting infrastructure. And that's what we need to focus on. I think I could probably spend four years uh, in the city uh, as a representative on city council focusing on why do the roads keep falling apart so fast when there's other Northwest cities that keep their roads in one piece. So um, if you were at the event Saturday, who was at the event Saturday again? Most people. Okay, so Mike Fagan and I were on stage. We do a show. It's called The Right Spokane Perspective. It's on every day at 9 in the morning and 9 at night on 96.5 FM. So we did a, uh, and 6.30 AM, and we did a mock radio program. And, and I wanted to thank Mike for the city putting down gravel when the roads were real icy. But then the ice melt and I realized it was just deteriorating asphalt. <laughs> so that was a joke I got to throw out there. And of course, the city of Spokane, one of the other things that's happening right now is they're um, looking at a new snow removal plan. Good timing. Good timing. So I told Mike, snow removal in Spokane, what we've been accustomed to, um, we call it spring. So anyways, <laughs> have a good night. Enjoy the Bannon show. Uh, get a hold of me, uh, votetimben at gmail.com, and uh, come talk to me and help out the campaign if you can. Spokane City, what district? It's Spokane City Council District 1. We're the one with the giant hole in it that where the north-south freeway should be coming through, hopefully. Northeast Spokane. Yep. So it, it is interesting, you know, the Spokane City Council has seven members. We've got Tim Ben, Tony Keepy, and Mike Fagan, 
And, you know, it isn't going to change the majority, but it sure can change the conversation. So uh, we need to do everything, even though we live in the county, we need to do everything we can do to help the city out. Because, like I said, unless you guys want to build a wall along Havana Street and keep those Spokane City people out, Spokane Valley is going to get pretty contaminated quickly. So now for Spokane Valley... And remember, one of our main reasons for changing the night from Tuesday to Wednesday was so that we could start hearing from some of these folks. So tonight, I think it's really great that Mike Munch is here to sort of let us know what's going on in the Spokane Valley and what's happening in, in your part of the, the city council political swamp. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Munch. I got appointed uh, when we had a couple of quitters last year, so that was closer. Uh, so I got appointed last year in uh, August. Um, so it's been a, a steep learning curve, but I've really enjoyed it. Uh, a couple of things that we've done recently have to do with oath of office there. Um, so we got, uh, <coughs> excuse me, support and uphold and defend the Constitution put into the oath of office for all of us and the uh, the uh, chief of police and the city manager and then uh, right now me and Rod are, are working on getting uh, emergency management uh, up to snuff basically because we don't have a very good plan for the county at this point and me and uh, and Sam and Ed are working on getting some uh, urban farming regulations so that uh, you can have some small animals and uh, and use produce on your lots to do a little idea. sustainability stuff going on. So, uh, so those are about the biggest things. Uh, right now there's five of us that are up for election this year. So if we don't want Spokane City type coming in here, we got to keep all of us on there because we work well together. And it's uh, it's been a cohesive team so far. So it's about all I got unless anybody's got any questions. I think what would be interesting is just to let the folks know why we had so many appointments all at once. So, in case you don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, Sam Wood got elected last year, or two years ago, I guess, at this point, and that flipped the council into a more conservative bent than it had been before. As soon as they started getting some of the conservative policies that we've all wanted for years in place, a couple of them decided that they were going to take their ball and go home. So that opened up two appointments right there, and then the third one came from a medical leave, basically, and an appointment that was just for a year. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, even with Spokane City, if, if we only get three, even if you start pushing back a little bit, they don't like it when they lose. So there's a, there's a good chance that we could take Spokane City back in relatively short order if we got that. What is, what is the push that pushback that you're receiving right now from the leftists? Uh, they're... Repeat the question. Just so uh, The question was, what is, what is the pushback we're getting from the, the leftists right now? There's not a, a big population in the valley of them, so, so that we're lucky that way. Uh, but <laughs> but <laughs> they are out there, and we are getting... You know, I mean, if you, if you read the... Diana Wilhite is a leftist, so I just want to <laughs> So, yeah, if we clarify that way, then we are getting some pushback um, that way, and, and they're, they're out for blood and want all of us gone is, is basically their big, their big push right now. But they'll, they kind of oppose anything that we do, whether it's meaningful or not. So, you know, but they don't, they don't have a voice right now, so we've got, we got to keep it that way. Keep that going yeah. Thank you. Okay, super. Thank you very much. So what Mike was talking about, you know, we all know that uh, we have leftists and we often think that those are the Democrats or the progressives or whatever. In Spokane Valley, it's sort of the Republicans against the Republicans. So you do need to sort of figure out who's who and all that good kind of stuff because just none of you do this. But there's a whole tremendous number of people out there that vote because a person has a D behind their name or an R behind their name. Spokane Valley is one that you really need to know who these folks are and what they stand for because if you just think, well, it's got an R, so it must be good, you could be fooled. So, and let's face it, you could be fooled anywhere, but particularly in Spokane Valley. 
Okay, I get the night off now, and I just love this. Uh, John decided that he was going to prepare tonight's uh, program, and I said, super. And so I get to step down, and he gets to come forward, and uh, I don't know how he operates. I think you're fine. We've but, never done uh, this. <laughs> but I think this is wonderful. Okay. So cool. Welcome, All John. Right. All right. Finally, John. Finally. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see. Did we get it? Okay. So who is Steve Bannon? Steve Bannon is an American citizen, a former investment banker and filmmaker who currently serving as the White House Chief Strategist and Senior Counselor to the President in the Trump Administration. He's been in this capacity since January 28, 2017. He has also been a regular attendee to the Principals Committee of the National Security Council. When we look at his history, He's been a naval officer. This is amazing. I mean, check out these avocations. By the way, he's three years younger than me. That really freaks me out. I mean, that is, that is I, I was stunned. I mean, in fact, I kind of looked like him about six hours ago because I was all gravelly. And, anyway, U.S. Navy officer, investment banker, urban planner, futurist, a filmmaker, producer, crony government investigator, journalist, editor, anti-establishment Tea Party activist, supporter of constitutional conservatives. When I say supporter, I, this isn't in here, but you know, he, he started the Ted Cruz pack. He, $10 million he gave Ted Cruz when he got started. He believed in him. That's it's substantial. CEO of the Trump campaign and a strategist and counselor now to the president. Look at that as your resume, what you've done over the last 15, 20 years. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I thought he was a racist. You thought he's a racist? Well, that's not a pro that's look at me, honey. That's not a profession. <laughs> okay, let's uh, uh, go through his early life. So, this is born named Stephen Kevin Bannon, born in North Fork, Virginia, working class Irish Catholic family. His father is a telephone lineman. That's I mean that's you know that's just about as normal as anybody that I've oh no he didn't come out of anything great he really didn't. He had a Democrat upbringing and changed to a constitutional conservative. His family was pro-Kennedy, pro-Union, Democrat family. When he went to school, he went to Virginia Tech in 76, and he graduated, where's my thing, with a, a BA in urban planning. I thought that was a little bit liberal. I mean, it kind of is, if you think about it. Uh, you know, planning how we're supposed to live and pack them and stack them and all that kind of stuff. And we'll see what he did with that. It's very interesting. Uh, he went to Georgetown University in 1985, and he got his master's in national security in foreign service. Now, this will all tie together as we go through his, his life, but all of this blends in with all kinds of work. It's not like I went to Georgetown. That's all I did, you know. Most people go to college. I used to hang around in college towns. You were in a college town. You went to school. You went, got out. You went, and, you went to Jack and Dan's, and you had dinner all night, right? Uh, not this guy. Uh, and then he went to Harvard University, got his Master's of Business Administration, and he graduated with honors. So let's go to the military years. Bannon signed up for the Naval Reserve in 1976 after graduating from Virginia Tech, arrived at 24 years old at the Navy's Training Center in Rhode Island in 1977. The following year, he set sail aboard the USS Paul F. Foster, on which he would travel mostly in the Pacific and Indian Oceans from 1978 to 1980, stopping at ports in countries such as the Philippines and Singapore. And mentioning that because that really had an impact. You got to see how the people in the world lived, you know, the, the stench of it, the, the, the problems that they have. He got to really experience that. And it was an anti-submarine destroyer whose mission was to trail air anti to, to trail aircraft carriers and keep them safe. That was his job. He was an ensign and then a lieutenant junior grade. His first job gave him responsibility for engineering, including air conditioning, hydraulics, and electronics. It was, quote, all of the inelegant work of the ship. 
That's what Edward Sonny Masso, a retired rear admiral who served with Bannon said. He said, not just anybody succeeds at that job. Uh, so I, I can really kind of relate to that. Uh, there's a lot of things that I do other people don't do. And it's, it's, it, I just so much about this guy really interested me because he wasn't like, oh, I can't do that. How many people we see today, they can't do anything. You know, they just really are stuck with, oh no, I, I, I don't do that. Uh, it cracks me up. Anyway, later, uh, Bannon became a navigator. So while he's in the Navy, he learns navigation and uh, to guide the ship at times with the sextant when the electronic system lost contact with satellites. And that happened once their whole navigation system went out and he literally was in charge of taking that boat halfway around the world with a sextant until they could get to where they could fix that piece of equipment. Okay, um, next is the situation in Tehran. And so when that happened, it was just after midnight on March 21st, 1980, when the USS Foster, navigated by Stephen Bannum, met with the supercarrier USS Nimitz in the Gulf of Oman. The convoy headed near the Iranian coast where a secret mission would be launched a month later to rescue 52 U.S. Embassy hostages held in Tehran. Bannon's ship trailed the Nimitz, which carried helicopters that would try to retrieve the hostages. But before the mission launched, Bannon's ship was ordered to sail to Pearl Harbor, and he learns while at sea that the rescue had failed. As you can see, the U.S. helicopter crashed into another aircraft in the Iranian desert, killing eight servicemen and dooming the plan to liberate the hostages. He said, I have the perfect word. And how the crew felt upon learning the mission failed, said Andrew Green, one of Bannon's shipmates. Defeated, we felt defeated. As Bannon told it, the failed hostages rescue is one of the defining moments in his life, providing a searing example of failed military and presidential leadership. What that, one that he carries with him as he serves as President Trump's chief strategist. That's what he recognized. There was no, there wasn't any thinking. How many times have we looked what's going on in our government saying there's, there's no thinking here? So that's what he was relating to. Um, he has said he wasn't interested in politics until he concluded. Is that to me? I'm sorry, okay. He has said he wasn't interested in politics until he concluded then President Jimmy Carter had undercut the Navy and blown the rescue mission. So we're going to watch a short video here. This, this video is titled, How Bannon's Navy Service During the Iran Hostage Crisis Shaped His Political Views. It's very short, but it'll give us an idea of where he's at. Stephen Bannon, President Trump's chief strategist and the founder of Britbart News, um, has said that the incident that he saw when he was in the Navy in 1980 has been a very important part of shaping his worldview. He was on a Navy destroyer as a navigator and a lieutenant junior grade um, when that ship went to the Gulf of Oman shortly before there was a rescue mission of 52 uh, hostages being held in Tehran. Good evening. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. Bannon has said that he really wasn't political until he got in the Navy and watched the Iran hostage rescue mission fiasco. Eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed. And several he wasn't there when it actually happened. So he was sort of on the edge of it, but he had seen things building up. Uh, he was near um, the Nimitz, which was the supercarrier on which the helicopters were to launch for the rescue missions. Well, according to his shipmates, um, Steve Bannon was very deeply affected and angry that President Carter, the president at the time of the failed um, Iran rescue mission, that he was upset with the way things went down. The eight service members were killed, the hostages were not rescued by Jimmy Carter, and this was also in the post-Vietnam era. According to one of Bannon's friends, we quote in the story, um, Bannon saw, you know, sort of an antipathy towards the military, was upset by that. After um, 1980, he went directly to the Pentagon, uh, right at the time Reagan was elected, and saw then uh, President Reagan do a big military buildup, reviving the Navy in certain ways, and he sort of idolized Ronald Reagan. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So he saw that buildup, and that made a big impact on him. In fact, one of his friends told us that when they were getting ready to leave the Pentagon around 1983, 
um, this friend said that Bannum told him that he'd like to come back one day as Secretary of Defense. Well, that didn't happen, but now he's chief strategist. Some might say that's even a more influential position given what Steve Bannon is and does mean to Donald Trump. Today, he is known as a very conservative uh, influence on President Trump. Uh, he was playing an influential role in the uh, immigration temporary ban on immigrants, certain immigrants from seven Muslim-dominated countries, including Iran. So if you hook these things together, back in 1980, he was near the coast of Iran during the rescue uh, mission fiasco. Um, he would have been well aware that uh, into the streets of Tehran, there were people shouting death to America while the hostages were being held there. Uh, and at this time today, he's also raised alarms about the Muslim world and certain radicals in the Muslim world and certain countries that are dominated by Muslims. So there does seem to be a line in his thinking um, going back all the way to 1980 up until today. So in October of 1980, with the Foster in port at Long Beach, California, Bannon went to retired Rear Admiral Masso's home to watch a debate between Carter and Reagan. Sorry, he wasn't retired then. He's still the Rear Admiral. Uh, but Masso said that he watched that debate like a prize fight. That's how, you know, do you remember when you got interested in politics? Do you remember when all of a sudden it was like important to see what was going on and how your guy was doing and, and whether or not you really felt that it was coming together? That's what was going on with Bannon in 1980. Three months later, after Reagan won the election, Bannon was working for the new president, serving as an assistant in the office of the chief of naval operations at the Pentagon. That's pretty, that's pretty astounding. He watched with satisfaction as Reagan increased the military budget and strengthened the Navy, with most of the focus on combating the Soviet Union. He served for three years and simultaneously studied national security and earned a master's degree at Georgetown University while he's at the Pentagon. Holy mackerel. Bannon decided to make a change in his education during this time, though. He said, quote, somebody told me if you want to go to Wall Street, you have to go to Harvard Business School. That's a big jump, okay? Um, so we're now looking at the Wall Street years. After receiving an MBA from Harvard University, which he worked at while serving at the Pentagon, Bannon worked at Goldman Sachs as an investment banker in the mergers and acquisition department from 1984 to 1990. When he left the company, he held the position of vice president and in 1990, Bannon and several colleagues from Goldman Sachs launched Bannon & Company, a boutique investment bank specializing in media. Through this company, Bannon negotiated the sale of Castle Rock Entertainment and wound up accepting, uh, he sold that, that entertainment group to Ted Turner and as payment, Bannon & Company accepted a financial stake in five television shows, including Seinfeld. A little bit later in 1998, Bannon and Company was purchased. Now, Steve Bannon is really quiet about his financial holdings and such investments. However, if Bannon owned only 1% share of the profits in the sale, he would have made about $32.5 million since 1998 in that one transaction. So, this is where <laughs> Bannon's urban planner and future and his personality comes in. You remember this? Anybody remember the pictures of this? Okay, so in 1993, while still managing Bannon and Company, Bannon was, make, was made acting director of the Earth Science Research Project Biosphere 2 in Oracle, Arizona. I mean, I would have figured those guys were out there living inside this thing, and they, they you know, before Skype, they had to figure out some way to talk to somebody without breathing on them. So this is, this is really amazing to me that he was doing these other things at the same time. Under Bannon, the project shifted its emphasis from researching space exploration and colonization toward pollution and global warming. <laughs> and so I, I, really, I could not find out what he learned about global warming, but considering his views, I could speculate, <laughs> right? Okay, so he left the project in 1995. So following the sale of Bannon and Company, uh, Steve Bannon became an executive producer in Hollywood. Now, what do film producers bring to the industry? Anybody know? 
Money. Okay. So uh, he brought money to the industry. He was the executive producer for Anthony Hopkins' 1999 Oscar nominated film, Titus. Bannon became a partner with entertainment industry executive and talent manager Jeff Kanitz at the firm, um, a, firm a, a film and television management company. Kanitz managed the Backstreet Boys and had a list of clients that included Ice Cube and Martin Lawrence. I've never heard of Martin Lawrence, and I, I've got plenty of Ice Cubes in the house, so I know what those are. Um, <clears throat> the firm acquired former Disney chief Michael Orbitz's company, Artist Management Group. And as Vanity Fair reported, Orbitz spent $100 million building the company, and Ban made an offer of $5 million for it. And then he negotiated it up to $12 million. I mean, this is the kind of background he already had from working at Goldman Sachs with the, the, the trades that he was doing. It was amazing. He just ran into this thing. So after that, he started to make, put more of his money. Oh, I'm sorry. I was off a little bit there. But So he started putting his money into his own films. So in 2004, Bannon made a documentary about Ronald Reagan titled The Face of Evil, which ultimately is how he connected with Andrew Breitbart. The story came from Peter Schweitzer's 2003 book, Reagan's War. Now, does anybody in here at this point know who Peter Schweitzer is? Okay, we've got like two hands up. Now, you're going to catch this guy's name because you're going to find there's this connection between Bannon and Schweitzer and, 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 uh, and Breitbart and, and another money guy. His name will come up here all the time. And, and these people have been responsible. I just want to, you know, want to share it ahead of time. They've been responsible for why we're here today. If they hadn't done this, we wouldn't be here today. It's just an amazing story. Amazing story. So, um, you know, it's a great way, yeah. So, uh, Peter Schweitzer, it's a name you want to remember because they're in charge today. Okay, so with the re release of Cochise County, uh, in 2004, and border war in 2006, it started to become clear where Bannon's political focus was taking him. In, uh, oh, that's, that slide's not coming up. So there was a slide here that also talked about, uh, well, that, no, no that's, that was, that's good enough. So these are two that he did to appease his audience. I mean, people were saying, why are you doing all this political stuff? So he, he did a, a, video, a movie on Notre Dame football, and he did one with Val Clymer on the chaos experiment. Uh, because he wanted to show the world that he could film, produce contemporary entertainment. And then in 2010, he released Generation Zero. Now, we've shown that movie at movie night. Yeah, a long time ago, but, you know, it came out in 2010. And, w but it was based on this novel, uh, 1997 book called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe. And this book... Um, you can still get it at Amazon. It, it, it's one of the driving forces in Bannon's worldview. He is seen with a dog-eared book and quoting from it often. He's, you see him walking around the White House with it. This is, this is like his little Bible. And we're going to hear more about the four turnings uh, from a piece of, of Bannon's video here a little bit later on in the presentation. So in 2010, he also brought us Battle for America with Dick Morris. Remember back in 2010, we really thought Dick Morris was a real conservative guy, remember? And then he kind of waffled because he's floating around the Democrats. Remember, he worked with the Clintons and all that. And then he's, now he's back. All of a sudden, he's a real Trump guy. It's just... So, you know, knowing these people's history is really important. Otherwise, we just, you know, we walk in on it. We go, oh, he's a great guy. Well, you just, you got to get the big picture to know where these people are coming from. Okay? Yeah, and we showed Fire from the Heartland. Uh, that was the, uh, called The Awakening of the Conservative Woman featuring Michelle Bachman, Ann Coulter, Dana Loesch, and Cynthia Loomis. Now, uh, next he brought out The Undefeated, which was Sayo Palin's story. You know, mayor from Wasilla to governor of Alaska to her candidacy for vice president and her rise to national prominence. This movie details how she became the darling of the Tea Party movement. And the film ends at the Madison rally where Palin challenged Republicans to fight like a girl. <laughs> you remember that? That was great. I remember that. The last shot. Huh? Yeah, like a hockey mom, right, right. The last shot is of Palin saying into the camera, Mr. President, game on. <laughs> it's a good movie. 
2011 also saw the release of Occupy Unmasked, which we have and we've never shown to you. I sit down and I watch it, and as, as he says in another piece that I was researching, he says, you know, you watch that movie and you feel like you have to take a hot, steamy shower when you're done. I mean, these, these people are, this is like the Berkeley crowd. I mean, this is, you could just say, well, you know, they just look human. You know, that's the problem with a lot of our society. They've just gone down the tank so far that it's, it's beyond us to be able to fix this stuff. But uh, uh, so Occupy a Match, which the purpose of it was to take a critical look at the Occupy movement that was happening back there. Remember Occupy Wall Street? And Andrew Breitbart and producer Stephen Bannon contend, see they were working together now, but they contend that the Occupy movement is sinister, it's violent, and organized with the purpose of destroying the American government. That was the intention. That was a total intention. So now we get to 2012. What was 2012? It's an election year, right? And so with the 2012 election year at hand, Bannon pointed to both the corruption in D.C. and the continuing failure of the Obama administration. So you see the theme here. Steve Bannon was and is passionate in exposing the corruption in Washington, D.C. And, you know, so when we think about here we are just four, four four and a half years after that, and we have all these new people who have come in to vote to take away this corruption. They could feel it. They don't understand all this history. They don't have any idea about it. They just want to change it. They want to get rid of it and move on. And so we really have to understand and be able to help them because they need to be grounded. They need to know what this past is all about. Um, next, uh, in 2013, uh, he produced um, Sweetwater, which was a Western thriller featuring Ned Harris. And Rickover, though, in 2014, is the story of the United States Navy Admiral Rickover, who is responsible for the use of nuclear reactors and ships Known as the father of the nuclear navy, he may well go down in history as one of the navy's most important officers. That's a quote from Bannon. Uh, it, it, I, I looked up, you could, you could talk for two or three hours just about that guy. It was an amazing story. So was it political? It had political parts to it, his, this admiral. But, but uh, those are the movies, those few right there, were the ones that really didn't have much to do with politics, where all the rest of it does. So when we look at uh, 2016 here, <laughs> we had fun with this movie, Clinton Cash. Who's it written by? Peter Schweitzer. Remember that name? Okay. Is an investigation of the foreign benefactors of the Bill and Hillary Clinton and Clinton Foundation. And if you watch this thing, it breaks down five or six of the huge scandals that they had, all the money they pilfered from the American public that they were going to give to Haiti and how they didn't. Oh, just rotten people. Also released in 2016 was this movie called Torchbearer, which fe featured uh, Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson. It was an election year urgent wake-up call for American Christians. And as we've heard from many, many sources, I mean, 30 million American Christians needed to get out and vote to make things happen. I don't know what the final numbers on that was, but that was part of Bannon's effort there to do that. So over Bannon's film career, he worked on 19 projects, and only four were not political. So he put his money where his mouth is. That's all I got to say about that. I mean, some of them seemed like a little bit of a B-grade movie, but they were all great intentions, good scripting, and all that sort of thing. So next we move to Breitbart. So what does Bannon have to do with Breitbart? Well, in 2007, remember, he met Breitbart back with the uh, filming of the, uh, the, Reagan, the Reagan movie. And uh, so he knew who he was, kept hanging around him. But in, in 2007, Bannon was a founding member of the board of Breitbart News, an online far-right news opinion and commentary website, which according to Philip Elliott and Zeke Miller of Time Magazine, has pushed racist, sexist, xenophobic, and anti-Semitic material into the vein of the alternate right. <laughs> so... Um, so, <laughs> oh, it is a great picture, isn't it? That came from the tree house. Um, so, uh, so Breitbart News paid a central role 
in the 2000 Acorn video controversy. Do you all remember that one? That was great, which resulted in the reorganization of the Association of Community Organizers for Reform Now, ACORN, okay? As well as its loss of private and government funding. How fun is that? Take away their money. Breitbart News contributor Hannah Giles posed as a prostitute, fleeing an abusive pimp, and seeking tax and legal advice on how to run an illegal business that included the use of underage girls in the sex trade, while James O'Keefe, who's been very busy this last year with his work, um, another contributor, posed as her boyfriend. They videotaped meetings with Acorn staff who gave advice on house buying and how to account on tax forms for the woman's income. Now, uh, in May of 2011, Breitbart's big journalism website reported on a sexually explicit photo linked to on New York Representative Anthony Weiner's twi Twitter feed. Weiner Twitter feed. Hmm, okay. Weiner initially denied that he had sent a 21 year old female college student the link to the photo, but later admitted to inappropriate online relationships. <clears throat> On June 6th, Breitbart News reported other photos Wiener had sent, including one that was sexually explicit. Wiener subsequently resigned from his congressional seat on June 21st. There's nothing like transparency, you know? It, it just yeah, really works. Wiener is married to Uma. Yeah, yeah. and Wiener was, is married to Uma. Maybe it's, maybe it's like the Black Widow, huh? That would work. Okay. <clears throat> on, on March 12th, after founder Andrew Breitbart's mysterious death, Bannon became executive director of Breitbart News LLC, the parent company of Breitbart News. Under his leadership, Breitbart took a more alt-right and nationalistic approach toward its agenda. Bannon declared the website, quote, the platform of the alt-right. He took ownership of it. It's great, he said in 2016. So, in February 2014, Bannon announced the addition of approximately 12 staff members and the opening of Texas and London-based operations. The new offices were the beginning of an expansive plan that included the addition of new regional sites roughly every 90 days, with new locations to include Florida, California, Cairo, and Jerusalem. Did you guys have any idea that Breitbart had spread out that far? No, I didn't either. I, it's just amazing. So according to a 2014 Pew Research Center study, 79% of Breitbart's audience report having political values that are right of center. Can't, can't, but you, well, of course, right? So in 2015, Bannon changed focus. He started to bring focus on the millennial political aspect and began courting their thoughts and perspective. Why is that Important. This is just this year, okay, last year, 2015. Why is that important? Look around the room. Look around our room. And what Bannon says is that it, it, that's our future. We must find out what's driving their thinking and we must help them to be able to see a different path. Because, uh, I mean, we did that to them. I, mean, I don't want to get offline here too far, but we did that. That's our responsibility. We are the ones that let our educational system drive this way for the last 50 years. We did that. So we need to fix it. Okay. In April of 2016, the Southern Poverty Law Center wrote that the website was openly promoting and had become associated with the beliefs of the alt-right. They must have read his post from a year before. Okay, and so then on August 17th of 2016, we're getting right up now, Bannon stepped down from his role as executive chairman to join the Trump campaign and its new CO. That's when he, you know, when Lewandowski stepped down, and that's when, and, and Paul Manafort got in, and there were problems. Steve Bannon had already been, ha that he was already dovetailed with him, and so he stepped down from Breitbart and started to run the Trump campaign. And speaking of his role at Breitbart, Bannon said, we think of ourselves as virent, virent, virulently, that's a hard word for me, virent, virent, I fell yeah. It, it doesn't look the same as it's supposed to sound, virulently 
anti-establishment, particularly anti the permanent political class. That's the thing. And we all talk about the need for term limits, but we must understand the reason, the reason we're stuck is because of that 50 years that we haven't been teaching. Two generations. Two generations of people who have come up, they have no idea what public virtue is about. They have no understanding at all of why a person would want to get into office to be able to keep and maintain what our country was founded on, not to be progressive and to get in there and change it so that it's new and, and um, transgender bathrooms. Let's just throw that in there. I mean, well, how, do you go for, how do you go from being conservative to that? It's just crazy. Okay, but we did that. And he understands that. And uh, so he's out of the campaign. I think I got to click off. All right, now, so the Breitbart website. Who took over for him at Breitbart? What's that? Who took over for him at Breitbart? I'm not, well, okay. No, do you want to do this? <laughs> okay, but I'll go ahead and answer a question. So when he stepped out of Breitbart, um, Peter Schweitzer became the chief editor of Breitbart News. Now, we're going we're gonna to cover more about what that is here shortly. So she hasn't seen this presentation, so that's all right. But she always likes to do that. That's good. Now, the Breitbart website broke a new record in August of last year with over 1 billion page views since January of that year. That is amazing. According to leading analytics giant Newswhip, Breitbart News is the number one political Facebook page in the world with two million more engagements than number two Huffington Post. That's, that's pretty astounding. And, and while that was going on, <laughs> while that's going on, Bannon co-founded uh, the Government Accountability Institute, known as GAI, whose mission it is to investigate and expose crony capitalism, misuse of taxpayer monies, and other governmental corruption and malfeasance. That's a mission statement for you. The Government Accountability Institute of the conservative nonprofit investigative research organization was located in Tallahassee, Florida. GAI was founded in 2012 by Peter Schweitzer and Stephen Bannon with funding from Robert Mercer and family. These are the people who have got us here, folks. These are the people who have done everything to help this conservative movement over the last 10, 15 years in a big way. They put the money up for it. Schweitzer serves as that group's president. The group is known for its involvement in the publication and investigative books, Clinton Cash, the untold story of how and why foreign governments and businesses help make Bill and Hillary rich, and Bush Bucks. How Public Service and Corporations Help Make Jeb Rich. Both were written by Peter Schweitzer. This is the image. This is the group. This is the GAI. There's Bannon back there with his baggy shorts and drinking a cup of coffee and you know, just being himself. And, and these people around the table, um, the names are unimportant. I got them here. You can read them. But the cheapest person there is making 300 grand a year from these guys. One of those people's making 650 grand a year. They are in this. They are dedicated. Look at them. They, they're working. I mean, this was a work picture. This is, this is not a posing picture. And they are young. And they are millennials. And they are thinking. And that makes me excited. Because that's the kind of... This is what's going to Trump. This is what he's reading. This is what he's hearing. Do you want to say something? When, when you hear the, the uh, leftists talk about these billionaires that are running our government, these are people who earn their money and want to give back, not criminal politicians that are stealing from us and not want to give a cent back. Yeah, thank you. And that's important. Exactly. So this was uh, the first piece of work that they put out was Clinton Cash, which is a phenomenal research, just phenomenal. Uh, I. I I don't know how much effect it really had in the last election, but boy, what, everybody that saw that movie was just wowed by it, just wowed. Well, and he put it online free. Yeah, he did, he did. Yeah, it was only, at, it went through the movies about, what, two and a half months, and then he put it online, and he said, that's it, you know, so he, he it wasn't about making money on it. Okay, the, the SPLC hate watch 
Now, this is a, we see this page quite often. We have, uh, uh, there's people here in our area that SPLC has on their list and, you know, the hate people. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, we haven't quite made it there yet, but, you know, people do say we're the leaders of hate. Uh, but look what it says here. The alt-right fears deep state retribution against Trump. And the date here is February 27th, last month, just a few days ago. This, is, this, is, this isn't the only one. There's several of them up here about uh, a Bannon. That's what I was searching on. Uh, but uh, it says, noted, as the so-called deep state turns into a real point of political discussion, the white nationalistic alt-right sees in its shadow an effort to undermine an administration whose ear they feel they have. Now, it's obviously true here. Uh, note the tweet from neoconservative shill Bill Kristol. Obviously, strongly prefer normal democratic and constitutional politics, but if it comes to it, prefer the deep state to the Trump state. You know who this guy is? You guys all know who he is? Okay, I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is our enemy. This is why Bannon said they are the enemy. So we, we got to know how, and we got to take a strong stand against that. So here we go. Let's pause and get a full impact of this scene. We have Reince Priebus, White House Chief of Staff. Now, I got to tell you, when Reince was picked, my skin crawled. I thought, oh my God, how are you going to, what are you going to do with this guy? You know? But on the other hand, I mean, you know, within 10 seconds, I'm saying to myself, well, John, uh, you've been saying all along, what are you going to do if Trump wins? Who's he going to work with in Congress? Who does he know there? And I think, well, he's got to know somebody. He must have made some deals somewhere along the way. You know, it's like Judge Napolitano. We all know who he is. And I was, I was so excited, you know, when I found out that, that Judge Napolitano has done several business dealings and is one of Donald Trump's biggest friends. I mean, you know, it's good to know you got friends like Judge Napolitano. But, uh, but, it, but that's different than now you're the president. How are you going to communicate with Congress? Well, this is how you do it. You know, so I don't know how I don't know what was made, I don't know what was said, all that kind of stuff. But there he is, White House Chief of Staff. Next to him is Steve Bannon, Chief Strategist and Senior Counselor to the President. Next to him, Sean Spicer, the Press Secretary. Next to him is General Michael Flynn, who was targeted for National Security Advisor. I think we're going to see him back in the White House shortly. I have no doubt about it because uh, too much is coming on on how this stuff was all stacked up and it was nothing stuff. Okay. Then we have Bryce, Vice President Mike Pence and of course our President Donald Trump. All of these people, all of these people surrounding our President are knowledgeable, they have high energy, they're productive people, they're all successful in their own careers and powerful within their circles of influence. You gotta understand that these are not people that walk out the door and nobody knows who they are. They are important people. It's reassuring to have a person with true paleoconservative constitutional values like Steve Bannon steering from the helm to keep the focus on our president's agenda and strategize the best way to accomplish those goals. This is an amazing working man's White House. I, we just, I've never seen a picture anywhere else um, of another president who had people that I would admire as much as what's in that picture. So let's get some quotes here. Uh, Ross Douthat authored a column in the New York Times about the new political battlefield. He said, perhaps we should speak no more of left and right, liberals and conservatives. From now on, the great political battles will be fought between nationalists and internationalists, nativists versus globalists. Taylor Lewis in The American Thinker wrote, Stephen Bannon explained the difference between economic populists like himself and the jet-setting crowd. We're a nation with an economy, not an economy just in some global market pace with open borders, but we are a nation with a culture and a reason for being. You know, that's what our millennials are looking for. That is what they're looking for, is a reason for being. Why are we here? Uh, you know, we look since the end of World War II, one of the industries that's just taken off uh, in, in the United States 
greatly is the personal development industry with many, many companies who are helping people to get grounded. And it stems from this missing attribute in life is that uh, this reason for being. Um, that's the deal. So, you know, in President Trump's first address to a joint session of Congress, as far as being an anti-globalist, he said, free nations are the best vehicle for expressing the will of the people. And, um, and America respects the right of all nations to chart their own path. Ron Paul could have said that. Ron Paul could have said that, okay? And he continues, says, my job is not to represent the world. My job is to represent the United States of America. And that's what we've got. Yep. That's what we got. I love this one on the media. The media should be embarrassed and humiliated and keep its mouth shut and just listen for a while. I want you to quote this. The media here is the opposition party. That's about as straight out as you get. Okay, they don't understand this country. They still do not understand why Donald Trump is the president of the United States. This was just, you know, a few months back and it's been festering ever since. Now on racism, there was an uh, interview that was with Mother Jones in August of last year and Bannon acknowledged that white nationalists and anti-Semites are drawn to the so-called alt-right movement. He said, he said uh, look, are there some people that are white nationalists that are attracted to some of the philosophies of the alt-right? Maybe. He said, are there some people that are anti-Semitic that are attracted? Maybe. Right? He says, maybe some people are attracted to the alt-right that are homophobes. Right? He said, but that's just like there are certain elements in the progressive left and the hard left that attract certain elements. See, that's the part I love. This guy's smart. He doesn't put people down. He just recognizes that in our uniquenesses and our differences, we're going to be attracted to different groups and different ideologies. But you know what I love about Trump, and it's obvious with Bannon, is it's not about any of that. It's all about being productive. It's about being a productive human being and fitting into society and making a difference. You want to be, you want to make, I mean, all of these guys that are in these pictures, they make money, you know, and, and, and they're giving back, and they're giving back. So that's, uh, we, we need to keep that in, in consideration here. Okay, where do they leave off? Oh, okay. Okay, Bannon on women. So in 2011, radio interview, Bannon had a hypothesis about why progressive women vilify prominent conservative women like Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin. So this goes back to 2011. Okay? And he said there, quote, that's why there are some unintended consequences of the women's liberation movement. He said that, in fact, the women that would lead this country, speaking about those in 2011, 2012 that were coming up to run for president or vice president, Tara Palin to be there. She says, in fact, women would lead this country, would be pro-family. They would have husbands. They would love their children. They wouldn't be a bunch of dykes that came from the Seven Sisters School up in New England. That, he, says, he says, that drives the left insane, and that's why they hate these women. See, that's the thing. It's, it's you know, so uh, now... Here, these are some other ones. Here's, here's Bannon on the GOP establishment. So according to The Atlantic, Bannon told a gathering of conservatives, we don't believe there is a functional conservative party in this country, and we certainly don't think the Republican Party is that. Okay? And he added, it's going to be an insurgent, center-right, populist movement that is virulently anti-establishment and it's going to continue to hammer this city, both the progressive left and the institutional Republican Party. And that's where we're at. That's exactly where we're at right now. So, um, and uh, let's move on to the next slide here. So we think of ourselves, he said, as virulently anti-established, particularly anti-progressive. And then when he was talking to the Washington Post, he told them in, you know, in the context of that conversation, he said, we say Paul Ryan was grown in a Petri dish at the Heritage Foundation. 
And you know, and I know there's a lot of people who really find that the Heritage Foundation has it's is a good, but is it establishment? It, wh what's the goal? You know, when we start to look at how many people really follow the ideology of the Council on Foreign Relations and the and the one world globalist government, that's what we don't want to have. You know, we'd like the whole world to work well, but why don't they work well because they want to be like us? Why don't they? Why don't we all work together and be productive and and have our own economies? I mean, that's that's really where we're striving for now at this point. Okay, um, so now we're going to watch a video. I promise you, have a video with him. So this is back again in in 2011. So it's five and a half years ago. 2011 it seems like a a decade or more ago, right? Uh, so it's five and a half years ago when he was speaking a year before the 2012 election. So that's where his mind was. He, everything was focused on what they got to get done over the next year in order to win that election. And notice his thoughts from then and compare those thoughts to his actions and the agenda of the president today. Please welcome Steve Bannon. September 18th, 2008, at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the Republican appointed uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Republican um, Secretary of the Treasury, a guy who used to work for at Goldman Sachs, Hank Paulson, went to the White House to see the President, a Republican, I might add, and uh, told him because of the mishandling of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers a few days before, you know, over the weekend on September 15th, where they didn't really calculate because it's quite complicated. They didn't realize that Lehman Brothers was the beating heart of the world's commercial paper market uh, and that the entire world and the commercial paper market is what funds the working capital of all the large corporations in the, in the world, that the world's financial system had basically frozen. And on Wednesday, for all you guys that have money market accounts, the prime reserve fund broke a buck for the first time. In other words, if you wrote a check for $1,000, you're going to get $900 back. Uh, the, um, the Fed had pumped $500 billion of liquidity in 24 hours into the system. Uh, and by the way, we know all this now because of Representative Kanjorski, who told it on C-SPAN and because of testimony in front of Congress. Uh, they did the spreadsheets and ran the numbers. They went and told the president that um, they needed an immediate $1 trillion of liquidity into the system or that the American financial system would freeze up and basically implode in 72 hours, that the world's financial system would implode in about three weeks, and that they could not guarantee um, any social and political chaos within a month. Uh, so President Bush sent him up to Capitol Hill. He didn't attend the meeting. He sent him up to Pelosi and Kanjorski and all these guys. And that's where they came up with TARP. Actually, Secretary Paulson went up with a three-page memo, if you remember. Uh, it was a bill. They needed a trillion dollars that night. Um, and the question gets to be, when you looked at the fiasco, and we'll go through some numbers in a second, um, how did a situation that, um, and we had some pretty sizable enemies in the 20th century. Hitler, Mussolini, the military junta in Japan, the Kaiser, uh, Lenin, Mao, Stalin, uh, you know, you go on and on and on. These guys couldn't even envision what we had done to ourselves, much less execute it. They actually told the president, unless you give us a trillion dollars immediately, and now we know from Bloomberg it was about $5 trillion of liquidity they needed into the system, of which, by the way, we've never really had an accounting, right? We don't have an accounting today of what really went on, of what liquidity got put into the system. This crisis is of such a magnitude. It's unprecedented in our country's history and unprecedented in the world's history. Let me just walk you through some math. Um, Depending on the assumptions you make, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and I realize people say, oh, they're contingent liabilities, but they're, they're, they're pretty locked in unless you uncontingent them. The liabilities of those three are anywhere from 60 to $100 trillion. 
at state level, the state governments today are about $3 trillion underwater. Municipal governments, you see in Harrisburg, the capital of Pennsylvania, I think just got taken over yesterday. Municipal governments, I think, are something like $2 trillion underwater. Uh, municipal uh, employee uh, pension funds are $2 trillion. Corporate pension funds are $1 trillion. The biggest problem we have, which never gets talked about in any debate, has not been brought up one time, the trade deficit, which every quarter, all the goods we buy from China and all the foreign oil we buy, it's $7 trillion. It's the beating heart of our problem. Not one question in eight debates has been asked about it. Doctor, there's a guy named Dr. Kotlikoff, on my radio show, in the Reagan administration, Harvard-trained PhD, head of Boston University's economics department, very low-key guy. They call him the $200 trillion man. He will walk you through a set of mathematics that shows you the liability side of the balance sheet's about $200 trillion. And his math is not that far off when you look at the assumptions. The total assets in our country, let's, let's talk about a balance sheet and an income statement so you can see the scale of the problem we got. All the assets combined, I think, in our country, all the stocks, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, privately held companies, LLCs, all of your companies, okay? All the cash, all the gold, all the real estate adds up to about 50 to $60 trillion in assets. And we have $200 trillion, and some of those are contingent liabilities, but we are upside down. The industrial democracies have a massive problem today we've never had. We are highly over leveraged. We have to go through a massive deleveraging, and we've built in a welfare state that is completely and totally unsupportable. Now, why this is a crisis, and by the way, Barack Obama is not the problem. Barack Obama is a symptom of a problem. We have to remove Barack Obama. I, I, I don't doubt that for a second. We, we, we have to remove Barack Obama as President of the United States. But that's only the, and let's talk about this. We had this huge, the reason you're here today on a Tuesday night, listening to some really great guys who are sacrificing their, their, their lives and, and you guys to come to support in one of these new organizations, when you could be doing anything else, and you're the kind of the thin blue line of, what, of what's going to save us, because I go around and talk to, to groups. Last night I was in Torrance. It's 100 people. It's always the same 100 guys, men and women, throughout the country every time I go. Okay? That's the scary thing. You, you are the guys who are really going to save us. So, so the, the, the problem is, is that these numbers are so esoteric that even the guys on Wall Street, the, at Goldman Sachs, the guys I work with, and the guys in the Treasury Department, because they've made some massive mistakes, and they're the first to admit that. But it's so tough to tie this together because the numbers are so esoteric when you talk about a trillion and a half dollar deficits and trillion, three trillion dollar in federal spending and all this. It's, the reason the Tea Party, after Santelli's rant, the reason the Tea Party revolt came about, it's the first time in our country's history that we've had a center-right movement principally led by women, right? If you look at the Tea Party, for the Jasons and all the guys, and I was out there in the, in the Americans First Prosperity and all the guys, this was the first time there was women out there, right, moms. And the reason it is is that women's are the, the women are the chief operating officer of the American family. You know, they don't need to know it's trillions of dollars. They know that every bag of groceries is 100 bucks. They know to fill up an SUV is 100 bucks. And they know that Buddy and Sis are going to a state college, state university, coming back $50,000 in debt and living back in, the, you know, in their room with the soccer trophies they got with, 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 no, with no job prospects. The reason I named the first film Generation Zero, the, the generation in their 20s and 30s, we, we've wiped them out. This is the first time in American history a generation's actually cha you know, given over command to something and we haven't passed on any positive increase in net worth, right? The sad thing about the Occupy Wall Street, when you look at those kids, is how ill-informed they are. That's the product. That's the product of the American education system. They have no more earthly idea of the fundamentals of our liberty the fundamentals of free market capitalism, and they know ze absolutely nothing about our history. That's why I call them Generation Zero. We've passed on zero net worth, and we've really, you know, and, and, and yet I see part of that, my daughter's part of that generation, 
that are fighting a war that's tougher than any war that our grandparents fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. So there is tremendous potential there. But we are passing them on unless we act immediately, unless groups like you can come together, because the political establishment is not going to do it. And people go, how can you say that? I say, let's just look at the empirical evidence. Since the Tea Party revolt, which the Republican establishment did not support, and if you remember and look back, go to Fox and look at guys I respect tremendously, William Crystal, Dr. Krautheimer, David Fromm, you look at all the, George Will, look at all the intelligentsia of the Republican Party and the, and, and the conservative uh, intelligentsia. They were mocking the Tea Party. They were mocking these grassroots organizations. The reason I made these films is that my buddies on Wall Street kept saying, oh, these women are a bunch of bimbos. Or, I said, you know, I know Governor Palin and I know um, Congressman Bachman. I know these women of the Tea Party. They're every bit as tough and smart as you guys are. I mean, think about it. If the elites are so good, how did we get in this jam? Right? And, but, here's the, but here's the part that, that, and that's why groups like you, <laughs> I'm not promoting you. If, if you don't hang together, this country falls apart. Well, become something very different at the other side of this crisis, because this is the fourth great crisis in American history. We had the Revolution, we had the Civil War, we had the Great Depression of World War II. This is the great fourth turning in American history. And we're going to be one thing on the other side. And by the way, the reason this is so tough is that before we didn't have competitors like China, uh, or we weren't in hock to guys that are our enemies, or we had an education and a value system of Judeo-Christian values that a guy like Abraham Lincoln could read the King James Bible, Shakespeare's plays, and Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, and that's all he had, right? And he, that he wrote the second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address, because that's all you needed, right? Um, if you look at it for a second, this, the, the victory in 2010, and because of groups of Club for Growth, American for Prosperity, the Tea Party movement, grassroots movement, it was an unprecedented victory, right? Not only at the federal level, if you go down and look at the state level, if you look at, we eviscerated the Democratic Party in the South and in the Midwest in state legislatures and in, in gov governorships, it was a massive victory. We, we got virtually no credit for that, right? The mainstream media and even the, even the Republican apparatus. Remember, the Republican Party came out with a marketing document 60 days before that that said we're going to cut $100 billion, the Pledge to America, right? Okay. The two big things, TARP being one, the second being the, the, the budget cuts after the 2010, right, the first budget, we cut $30 billion. And by the way, the Tea Party Patriots, if you go to Jenny Beth Martin and Mark Meckler's site, they say we actually increased by $3 billion, but it was a $30 billion cut, not a $100 billion cut because of all kind of, you know, we're, you know, we're prorated, we're in the year. The second was the debt debate. The federal spending, which is every bit as bad as the deficit, it's the scale of federal spending because it sucks dollars out from everywhere else. Federal spending, I think, is $3.5 trillion, $3.75 trillion for the next two years, roughly. It adds up to $7.5 trillion dollars in two years. In the debt debate we just had, we cut $60 billion. $20 billion one year and $40 billion the next. The, the numbers, those numbers are irrelevant, right? Because the system lacks the political courage to actually take it on. The hardest, nastiest days. If you look at Europe, just look what's happening. Look what happened in the House of Commons yesterday when some conservatives stood up and said, We've had it with Europe. We want out. We want out of this whole mess. And they turned on each other. I said this on Hannity back in February 2010 when he had me. They had a special for Generation Zero, the first time outside the Passion of the Christ they'd ever taken an hour for one movie. And I said, all the easy choices aren't back of us. All the easy decisions were years ago. Everything from here on in is going to be hard and nasty and ugly, and you're going to be called every name in the book. You're going to be vilified. And we did cross a line this, this past week on the Occupy Wall Street. Only, I believe, in the revolution were there any marches on Tories' houses. When they left and they marched on um, Rupert Murdoch's house and Jamie Dimon's house and Mr. Koch's house, uh, and there was one other, four houses they actually marched on. That shows you the types of things that are going to happen. 
cutting this budget, the, why is the budget not cut? Budget's not cut because it's not easy to cut. Everybody's going to have to take a hit here. And if we draw a line, and it has to be a tough line that no more taxes, no more tax increases. You're just, you're just exacerbating a problem. You're, you're going to see this election. Newt Gingrich said on my show the other night, he thinks it's the most important since 1860. I think this election is going to be the nastiest, ugliest in the history of this country. It's going to be Americans for Prosper. I, I end the film, The Undefeated. By the way, the film's not about Sarah Palin. It is Sarah Palin's story. But the reason I wanted to do it is that she is Walmart Nation. When the movie starts off, she's working on a commercial fishing boat in 1988 with her husband. They own a small commercial fishing boat. And she's not part of the, the cultural, political, economic, or social elite in the Matsu Valley, which is out of the loop in a state that's out of the loop, right? She is so obscure. She's more obscure than anybody in America today when she starts off. And 20 years later, she's risen by being constant on a handful of principles. But the undefeated is the values of the Tea Party. It's the values. I've been around this country now for three years, showing these films and talking to these Tea Party groups. And these are the people that are, as Rick Santelli so brilliantly observed, they're those who carry the water, not those who drink the water. They're the ones that hold our social organizations together, build our cities, run our little leagues, fight our wars, right? It's the backbone of this country. And they're enraged, and here's why they're enraged. They understand we have a system now that has socialism, as you point out so eloquently. We have socialism for the very poor, right? A system that a trillion dollars a year in welfare state benefits with no taxes, right? And 60% of the country getting that. And we have socialism for the very wealthy, right? The, the, the anger of the Tea Party is not racism. It's not, they're not homophobes. They're not nativist. What they are is common sense, practical, middle class people that understand that they're paying for their own and their children's destruction. Right? And that's the rage. You know, the bonus pool this year, the bonus pool on Wall Street of all the financial firms in 2000 in Seven, the year before, in 2006 and 2007, the two years were all the transactions that imploded in 2008. The bonus pool is, about, is going to be about the same this year, right? You know, TARP, when you said TARP, well, TARP, if, if our business, if your business or your business had gotten in trouble and Goldman Sachs, where I was trained, had come in and given you a, a, a financing, trust me, you would have been wiped out and you would have been fired, right? They weren't. All their stock is still is worth a ton of money because they weren't. We basically gave them free money and bailed them out. There's no recession in the Hamptons. There's no recession in Georgetown. The other day, the Washington Post reports five of the seven wealthiest counties in the country are the suburbs of Washington, D.C. The per capita income in Washington, D.C., for the first time in history, is greater than Silicon Valley. That is not a random event. What Sarah Palin, the reason I wanted to make the movie, Sarah Palin went up against the political class in Alaska and big oil. Because it, it wasn't that it was corrupt. There's always going to be corruption. There's always going to be bad guys taking money. That's human nature. Read Plutarch. That happened back in Greece and Rome. We have something much worse. A compromised political class. Crony capitalism in a permanent political class. Right? It's quite simple. How does a guy go to Washington basically making $100,000 a year as a lawyer in some locality, and at the end of 10 years, on $165,000 and another $15,000 by federal money he can make, having to keep basically sometimes two locations, how's his net worth $5 million? And in 10 years, like Harry Reid, how's Harry Reid's net worth $15 million? That's not even a mathematics, that's just arithmetic. How does that work? That's what the Tea Party, that's what this revolt is about. That's why we have grassroots organizations like AFP and Club for Growth. That's why we have things outside political parties, because people want their voice heard. You are the last line of defense. Three nights a week I do this throughout the country, and it's always the same hundred people in the room. But I will tell you, as Slade said so eloquently, if you look at the revolution, about a third of the people wanted liberty, a third of the people were hardcore Tories, and about a third were at, well, like in the middle and saying, I'm going to see how this thing plays out. 
right? Our country today is about the same thing. We're a center-right nation of probably 70, 30 center-right. But there's only a small core that's prepared to take their Tuesday night and not just write a check, but actually throw your being like Jason and the team have in trying to change this, right? And that's what's going to save it. A hundred years from now when they look back, if we come out of this crisis and we're still the country that Mark, Senator Rubio talked about of American exceptionalism based upon Judeo-Christian values, right? Believing in freedom and being the greatest country in the world in the torture of freedom, if we're that country and it's going to take us 20 years to get through this, right? It's going to be because of guys like you. And if you quit, we are done, right? We're going to be something very different on the other side. I mean, you can already see in, in President Obama, you can already see what that's going to be, right? Because that's just the harbinger. The Occupy Wall Street, I, I tell guys, don't dismiss these kids. Listen to them because it's a shot in the heart of what they believe. And that is off the, the education system that's taken more money than any education system in the history of the world. Listen to what they believe. That's the future. If you guys don't stand tall. So I, I want to conclude tonight in saying that I'm actually energized. And you know why? Think about it. I know all you guys do this. You all, you've all read history books since you were kids. And you all think, hey, if I was there during the Civil War, you know, I'd be right in the middle of it. Or if I was in the revolution, if the revolution, I would be right there, right? Or in World War II or the Great Depression, all that stuff that guys had the Great Depression or World War II, I would be there. I'd be in Normandy. I'd do all that. We have that opportunity today, right? They're going to look back at these 10 years, 15 years, and it's going to take us that long. And we're going to have, by the way, we're going to have defeats. There's going to be days when it looks, that's why you, I, I want you guys to see the movie, the, the, the um, um, Generation Zero, because the guy at the end of it tells you, kind of gives a broad perspective. There are going to be days that's going to look so gray and so overcast and like we've lost, like the day Obama won. We're going to have more days like that. But if we hold together and we see it in exactly what you said, there's so many people that believe in what we believe and understand when you start talking to them and engaging them that we're, you know, we're not cloven hoof devils. We're not nativist, homophobic, racist, right? But they, they understand that we believe in what made this country great, and they believe it too. But they're inundated with a mass media and an education system that's really stolen that from them. And for every Drudge or Andrew Breitbart or these little things you have, for every AFP and for every Club for Growth and for every one of these organizations, you've got this overwhelming apparatus and apathy. Apathy of the middle and apparatus on the left. But we can do it. And I've seen it. And we've seen it in 2010. That victory was humongous. And I realize people, some people are upset that Governor Palin is not running or they're, they're searching for the man on the white horse and one day it's Governor Perry and one day it's Herman Cain, everything like that. It's not about any one individual. It's about teams. It's about doing this. It's about next year when we have this, on the first annual shareholders meeting, we have 500 people in this room. And half of them are under the age of 40. It's ideas. And it's, and it's, it's taking those ideas and action. And trust me, you guys are on the right path. This is not a waste of your time. Because if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. And if it doesn't get done, we're going to lose this country. And we're going to be looked at, listen, this is the last thing I want to leave you with. Only one, gen I think there's been 14 generations in this country's history. Only one generation is looked down as not having fulfilled the Burkean Compact, which is we owe as much to the people who came before us as the people before us. We're an agent in time, right? And we have a sacred duty to withhold traditions of the past, our best traditions, and pass them on to the future. Only one generation in our history didn't do that. That was the generation of leadership before the Civil War. Civil War could have been averted. It wasn't because of a failure of leadership. We are the baby boomers in this room. We're the second generation that's going to be looked at as having let this country down unless we turn immediately and get our hands around the problem. And through the Tea Party, through these grassroots movements, through things like Liberty Restoration, we're doing that. And, and trust me, there's tremendous power in doing this. So thank you very much. I'm here to help you guys anytime you want.
Well, am I on? Okay, so Bannon is one of the most interesting persons.